Today I'm going to talk about stress triaxiality and how that influences the response of thermoplastics. So when one talks about the deformation behavior of thermoplastic materials, one usually talks about the deviatoric stress. That really is what drives the deformation of most materials, not only thermoplastics. Um, let's take a look at what the definition is of a deviatoric stress. It's given here in this equation here. Um, you see that's really just the total stress minus the pressure component of the stress. And that is what drives the deformation behavior on most thermoplastic materials. So when I talk about stress triaxiality, what I mean is it's different quantities. Basically, the normalized uh, stress, uh, as shown here, is the pressure divided by the Mises stress. And that is the definition of stress triaxiality. So this is the pressure component and how that influences the response of your material. And there really are three different ways that the stress triaxiality and pressure can influence the response of your thermoplastic material in a way that's perhaps not so obvious to most people. And that's what I want to talk about here. So first, let's look at the definition of stress triaxiality and how that it has different values in different loading modes. So if you look at this table here, you can see that the stress triaxiality for different loading modes has a value between minus infinity and plus infinity. So that doesn't really help us, but there are some specific cases that are easy to remember and use. So simple shear, there is no pressure in simple shear, so therefore the stress triaxiality is zero. Uniaxial tension is one divided by three, a third. Biaxial tension is two thirds. And in compression, the corresponding values are uh, minus a third and minus two thirds for uniaxial and biaxial compression. So those are the values that people often uh, keep in mind when you work with stress triaxialities. Um, what I want to talk about now is the three different re uh, influences the stress triaxiality has on the behavior of thermoplastic materials. So let's look at behavior number one. That is how the stress triaxiality and pressure influence the yield stress of a material. When we talk about thermoplastics, it's not really the yield stress that only is influenced. It's also the viscoplastic flow after yielding has started. And many of these materials, thermoplastics of different kinds, thermoplastic elastomers, polyurethanes, etc., they have a yield surface that doesn't really exist. So a non-existing yield surface, the viscoplastic flow is a gradual creation. It's more of a viscous event for the onset than it is for metals that have a well-defined yield surface. So the way you simulate this in finite element simulations is typically to use the equation shown at the bottom here. So this is the scalar equations that tell you how the rate of viscoplastic flow is driven by, in this case, the shear stress tau. So tau is a Mises type shear stress. And um, that is typically the, the main component for why a material will start the viscoplastic flow. But the stress triaxiality influences this, so that if you have a hydrostatic pressure on your material that compresses the molecules in it, then it usually takes slightly more shear stress to initiate the viscoplastic flow. So that is the main way in which stress triaxiality and pressure influences the viscoplastic flow of thermoplastics. And the way you simulate that in many cases uh, in the simulation is to change the, the yield stress here, flow resistance tau hat, and adding another component, the P is the pressure, to modify basically the stress resistance by this pressure dependence of the material. And A is, is the, the parameter to control how strong the dependence on pressure is of the flow resistance. This is something we can actually investigate very quickly and easily using M calibration. So I'll take a look at that right now. So here's a window of M calibration that I pre prepared. I have two load cases. They're both virtual load cases. I don't have actual experimental data in my example here. I want to demonstrate the modeling side of it. We have tension and uniaxial compression. And I set up a three network viscoplastic model, a T and V model from the polyhumor library. And I, I just have default values for everything except the parameter P0. So P0 is controlling the influence of stress triaxiality and pressure on the flow behavior. So if I run this once, you can see this is the, the response in tension and compression. 
Um, this is true stress, true strain that I'm plotting here. See that it's almost symmetrical that the yield stress and tension is the same as compression. compression. That is what happens if you have a P0 value of zero. So we want to explore what happens if we have different values of this pressure dependence of the material. I'm just going to click on parametric study. I'm going to change the values that I'm going to explore, make it 0, 1, and 2. And I'm going to click run evaluate here. What we see then is that um, P equal to 0, a P0 equal to 0 gives you a symmetric response. But if you have a larger positive value of P0, then you will reduce uh, the yield stress and tension and increase it in, in compression. Create this asymmetry that occurs in certain thermoplastics. Uh, often, for example, poly uh, Teflon type material, PTFE, has this kind of dependence. So this is just an example of how you could do it in, in terms of the simulations. You certainly would need to do experiments on your material to det determine how strong this effect is. It's certainly not all thermoplastics that have this effect, but many do. That's why I typically recommend that you perform both tension and compression experiments on your thermoplastic to determine how strong this influence of the pressure and the stress triaxiality is on the yield behavior and the flow response after yielding. All right, so let's talk now about the second influence of stress triaxiality on the material response of fluoropolymers. That has to do with the volume change that occurs during plastic deformation. So when you take a piece of material, um, a metal, for example, and you deform it beyond the elastic domain and you start to plastically deform it, typically metals have a volume conserving plastic deformation. So the, the, the plasticity occurs with constant volume. For thermoplastics, that's not always the case. Uh, the, the Poisson's ratio, if you want to use that to describe the plasticity and the volume response of the plasticity, is, is around 0 0.4, or 0 0.45, or something like that in the undeformed configuration at small strains. But as you go through the, the onset of viscoplastic flow, this Poisson's ratio, the plastically defined Poisson's ratio, can either go up or down depending on the nature of your thermoplastic material. And here are some examples in this little figure that shows you you can achieve this and you can match this data using a parameter yeah, in a material model. So in this case, I'm using the Polymod 3 network model, again, the TNV model. There's a BB parameter that allows you to specify how the plasticity occurs in terms of volume conservation or not. So that can be very powerful. Of course, to use this feature, you would need to actually experimentally measure how the Poisson's ratio depends on the applied strain. And then you can use that and find this parameter um, in your material model calibration procedure. So that's the second influence of stress triaxiality. The third influence of stress triaxiality is related to the ductility and the failure response of the thermoplastic material. So it's well known for metals, and what's, this has been done a lot in the automotive industry, that people use a stress triaxiality-based failure model to predict the failure of these materials. And the same approach can be used for thermoplastic materials too. That is, if you have a piece of material and you pull on it, you will certainly have higher stresses at a stress concentration. If you have a nudge or, or wedge at, in the material, in the component, that will typically lead to higher stresses due to stress concentration. But you can also have a stress uh, enhancement due to the stress triaxiality. So it can be double reasons for having early failures in those locations. So if you want to investigate this and make sure that your material model can predict safety factors, you need to take this into account. You need to do experiments, not only on straight dogbone shaped specimens, but I also recommend that you do it on specimens with notches on them. These notches will introduce a higher stress triaxiality, and then you can determine how much the stress triaxiality influence the failure response of your material. So experimentally, it's not that hard to do, and that gives you the information you need. Once you have that information, you can put that into whatever material model you're interested in, if you, if you select carefully, that is. And now let's dine out the SAMP1 model. It's one example of a material model that can do this type of stress triaxiality, dependence of the failure behavior 
Another one is the polyuma T and V model that I talked about earlier in this uh, little uh, video. So that's kind of how you would do it. I can demonstrate this in M calibration as well. So I have another M calibration file here. It's a very simple uh, file where I have activated a failure model and they're doing uniaxial tension and, uni and biaxial tension. There's no experimental data, it's demonstrating concepts here. So if I click run once, you'll see that the biaxial tension fails here and the uniaxial tension fails here. So if we look at the last portion of our definition of the TMV model here, we have a failure model activated. It's an isotropic failure model. And the failure strain is strain rate independent and it's equal to 0 0.3. That's why we get failure at this point here in our uniaxial test. In the biaxial test, the failure strain is different because of the nature of the strain state. So that is not due to triaxiality, that's just simply because of the strain state dependence of this uh, uh, material failure condition. If we want to change the, the triaxiality condition here and the, the influence of that, we can do that using the, the factors here, F1, F2, and F3. And um, the way that works is that for each uh, triaxiality value, so this is a tra stress triaxiality of zero, the factor is one. If the stress triaxiality is 0 0.3, it's also assumed to be one. 0 0.3, as you remember, is uniaxial tension. And stress triaxiality of 0 0.6 is close to biaxial tension. So if I want to make it um, fail less early in biaxial tension, or perhaps I want to do make it fail earlier at the stress triaxiality of 0 0.3, I can simply do that by reducing this F2 value to a half. And if I do that, see I push this back uh, by reducing that. I basically made it more uh, pressure dependent at that particular stress triaxiality value. So once you have the experimental data, you can use it to plug it into your uh, finite element simulations. In many cases, people think that you need to activate element deletion when you run these finite element simulations. That's not necessary. The key often is to figure out safety factors. But you can't have those safety factors being accurate unless you take into account also the stress triaxiality dependence of the failure condition. So here is how you would do it uh, as I demonstrated. Um, so those are the three ways in which stress triaxiality and pressure influences the response. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them in the section below. Thank you.